This is our host, Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce, who runs these panels for us. And she's having some internet problems, so she's probably going to come and go. So um, I think that we could all take this moment while her internet connection is restarting to introduce ourselves. So I'm Anna Kensing. I started watching The Supernatural from the very beginning um, in season one. I took a step back a little bit sometime, you know, sort of mid-series and then came back with a roar. I've dabbled in some fanfic. And I also um, yeah, um, write queer romance, um, paranormal, historical, and contemporary queer romance that um, some of which, you know, Sam and Dean would uh, feel right at home at. So maybe somebody else can um, introduce themselves while Gail is coming back. I'm Ann Wicker, and I'm a writer and editor and I came late to the supernatural fandom and went completely down the rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, I'm Hansi Oppenheimer. My company is Squee Projects. I, I support creativity and uh, transformative works, especially. Um, I'm a filmmaker and oral historian. And um, I did make a film about uh, fangirls and interviewed uh, Ruthie Connell, uh, Kim Rhodes, um, Grand Buckmaster, a lot of the, you know, the, the great moms <laughs> of uh, Supernatural. Hi, I'm Lorena Aker uh, for Supernatural. I am the uh, co-chief managing editor of the Winchester Family Business, which is the largest fan website for Supernatural. I started that, uh, started participating in that around season eight. And I have been writing for Supernatural and both for Twilight since then. I don't know. Am I back? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you seem to be. Um, I'm Electra Hammond. I'm a writer and an editor. And I watched Supernatural from that very first episode all the way till the last one made me cry. But I'm so confused that I was busy sitting around um, in another room waiting for the nine o'clock panel to start. So... <laughs> Those kinds oh, that of one too. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see me and hear me at the yes. moment? I'm going to put the questions in the chat. I will edit this beginning. Anna, would you mind driving? And I'll just feed questions and smile and nod. And sure. if I have connectivity, I might jump in at the end of a round, but that way it keeps going. Thank you. I'm, I apologize. I have no idea what's going on. That's You're flickering no like a ghost a little bit. If it's sort of, okay. sort of, you know, the captain type thing. It's a little creepy. <laughs> oh well, that's me. Um, okay, technology, let's start, you know. Yeah. Uh, let's start with who is your favorite mother figure, and let's uh, do one per round. You can repeat, um, but tell us who your favorite is and why, and then we'll just keep on going. You want to um, give us an order, so we. Um, in, on my screen, it's Anne, Electra, Lorena, Anna, and Hansi. I guess. Anyway, my favorite mother figure is Jody because I think she embodies, mm -hmm. I think she embodies the practical side that, <laughs> that Sam and Dean need. And then having lost her own child, you know, mothering the three girls, you know, whatever you feel about wayward sisters, she, she's their mother and, and she steps in to help, um, patients. And it's just, I think that her whole just persona is such a good, um, mother figure for them, even though she's not that much older than 17, but it, I, I think she's my favorite. And it's funny because even on like TikTok and stuff, she always says, you know, it's mom here. And she talks about mom advice. So like, she does feel like the fandom's mom too. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with Mrs. Butters. 
she's not there for very long, but she gives them all the things they didn't have growing up. Birthday cakes and Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas trees with little trains running around them and nightgowns and well, night shirts and all the Who is things this? that they desperately Butters. needed but didn't know it. Um, you know, for for just a brief period there, they had a motherly presence in their lives. Someone to all of the holidays. Life. Right? Make them breakfast and tell and, Dean that he gets tomato juice instead of smoothies and make them sack lunches while they go out to, to you know, like fight the monsters. Is that like the episodes or something? Because I don't this remember. This is the her. wood nymph. This is the wood nymph oh. who runs the bunker, the Men of Letters bunker. Yeah. I love Yeah, Ellen. she was on my list I, too. I think Ellen's my favorite because um, I think I relate the most to her, you know, like, you know, it being tough, being single, you know, with a kid and poor and and I just loved her bravery that she was gonna leave her kid at the end. Like it didn't matter. It was like she was gonna be with her there. Yeah, a hundred percent. I Ellen is my favorite mother figure as well. So I totally <laughs> agree. Um I was also going to say um Missouri Mosley um sort of the first mother figure that the boys get in season one she, I mean to be honest this is a bit of a cliche the you know sort of sassy black woman you know maternal figure taking care of her white kids like it's it's a little bit of a of a cliche but Loretta Devine is simply an awesome actor and she <laughs> just really sort of runs with the cliched role that she's been given um so she recognizes the boys without interruption interruption or without introduction she tells them that they grew up handsome she gives them a hard time she gives john winchester a hard time too um tough you know she's love. very sort of a little very much tough love so she's i think after ellen she's my favorite maternal figure um what about you lorena well, being almost last, I'll have to, I've been going down my list as you've each been checking off the ones I was going to say, because, you know, Jody is so popular and Ellen is fantastic. And I was going to say Missouri, but I do have another one and that would be Kelly Klein. And the re she didn't get a chance to be a mother to Jack um, other than when she was carrying him. But I just uh, was inspired by her dedication to her unborn child. She uh, stood by him no matter what anybody said about him, what they Whatever the prophecy, do. right? She knew right? he could be good. Yeah, she, she believed in him and knew he was good. And then the couple of times that he was able to talk to her, say, in heaven, she just gave him such warmth and comfort and as if she had known him. So I, I, I'm going to say um, Kelly Klein would be the next one on the list for me. Yeah. I think Gail, are you able to tell us who your favorite mother figure is? Uh, you guys have covered all of mine, but I'm also going to throw in Charlie, who was certainly not the right age to be their mother. But we all know that there are those people in our lives who might be our own age, but we still mother them. And I think in many ways, Charlie kind of mothered the boys. Um, she wasn't the baked cookies sort. She was the more hack the internet for you sort. But she still showed them that she loved them. And uh, so I, you know, I'm going to throw Charlie in there. Um, quick, while I'm still connected. <laughs> Second question. Uh, and we'll keep the same order. How does it show that the boys grew up motherless. When we look at Sam and Dean, how does their behavior and their their relationship with each other, how does that show that they um, they didn't grow up with really either a conventional father or a mother, but particularly a mother? Um, Want to start us off on that, Ian? Well, that that's a hmm. I I don't think it's real really obvious, but I think it's somewhat obvious in that they um they're not really dependent I mean they're so dependent on each other rather than 
the experience of having a mother and Dean had to be mother and father to Sam and take care of, take care of them. And, and, you know, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't fair. You know, there's, there's several places where Dean talks about it not being fair that he didn't get to be a child that he always had to take, you know, because of John's bad parenting and Mary being not there, he had to grow up fast. And, you know, at eight years old was, you know, taking care of his little brother and what he, Sam jumped off the roof of the shed or something. And Dean had to take him to the emergency room on the handlebars of his bicycle. You know, there was no mother to step in you know, little anecdotes like that is, or how we get that they took care of each other and and there was no mother figure there to, you know, bake cookies or whatever. Okay. Electra. Um, towards the very end in, oh, I don't know, season 13-ish, uh, Dean starts looking at regular life people with houses and jobs and and starts talking about how that is just not for us you know this is this is the life that that we lead and we're the guys that save the world and we don't do that and if they'd ever had a normal life without with a mom and then maybe they would have looked towards we can i mean other people we saw the example of Asa Fox. Other people like had houses and lives and families and managed to still be hunters. But these guys just, that's not for us. We're vagabonds. Well, they, had, they had no model for that, for a family, you know? I mean, they lived out of their car. <laughs> but they thought living out of the car was a perfectly normal thing to do. <laughs> right, which you do as a child, right? Whenever your situation is. But like, I mean, that would be abuse these days. Like, hey, and he does end up in foster care at one point, right? Uh, or reform school, I think. But yeah, kind of like the home for wayward wayward boys. Yeah, <laughs> you know, which thinks that's so, great. It, it's interesting because they're as as none of us mentioned their actual mother, Mary, and you know, Mary is such a complicated. <laughs> character and then they have this image of her in you know, Dean especially has this image of her in the head like bacon pies and all that stuff and like then the, then they hit the reality and so that's where you can really see how they didn't have a mother figure and, and they imagined it and then the reality was so different hold that thought because Mary is our fourth question uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's okay uh Anna yeah, I mean, I think that there's a number of place of points in both of their lives where they look for some sort of comforting maternal figure and they find her in different places. Um, you know, they find her in a temporary babysitter, they find her in a school teacher, they find her in, you know, some other sort of person who briefly was there to kiss the boo-boos and, you know, pat you on the head and say, there, there, dear. And so I think that that is like, we get like little pictures of that, little flashes of that throughout the whole series of the various ways in which they're, because I I don't think that John Winchester was that bad, as bad of a parent as some people do, but he clearly was not the like, kiss your boo-boo, cuddle you, read you bedtime stories kind of parent. And well, so- in that world with what he knew, I don't think he could have been that. You know, like when Sam says like, when I asked about the monster in the closet, he told me it was true. What? Do you, how? Why would you tell a kid? Like, I mean, right? He handed me a forty-five. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. So yeah. So. So. So John doesn't provide this kind of like sort of stereotypically maternal sort of 
love and comfort and support. Um, and so the boys, when they're younger, and I mean, definitely when they're older too, because we we just listed all of our favorite maternal figures who provided some sort of like love and support and comfort to, to these these boys when they're men, but but we also get various flashes of them seeking that kind of mommy, you know, sort of figure in in the various places that they're able to throughout their nomadic life. <laughs> okay, Lorena? I think I agree with a lot of what's been said already, um, but I think one of the other aspects would be that they didn't have any good memories or they didn't have memories that were um, warm and comforting and provided a basis of uh, any softness in their life. So a mother figure, whether it be provided by your mother or your father, the mothering usually is the one that gives you um, the unconditional love, the one that gives you the, um, the good memories of playing in the park or the birthday parties or whatever it might be. The, the soft uh, lullabies when you go to bed, you know, anything like that, that they don't have memories of. So there's nothing soft or um, easy about their lives. Unconditional love that usually comes from a parent or from a mother figure, they've given to each other. Um, and Bobby. <laughs> and, 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 right. Um, but there there isn't any um, any depth to the memories that they have that are good or supportive or, or um, real <laughs> comforting or real right right well and i'm going to toss in uh jody and donna even though they're not the right age to be the boys mothers you know some people are just the permanent they're the class mother even though they're the same age as everybody else they just mother everybody and yep. jody does that quite a bit um and I think one of the most heartbreaking scenes is when Sam and Dean are having dinner with Jody and the girls. And Dean is just going on and on about how great this meal is. And you mean you eat like this every night? And she goes, Dean, it's just chicken. And so just chicken, chicken breasts and maybe a mashed potatoes and a side dish. And Dean thinks this is fantastic. And there's, there's, yeah. that's just on it. You know, he doesn't get it, but I think Jody gets an insight into just how different their lives have been. And, you know, Donna is also very, she's right there with the punch in the arm and tell you it's going to be okay. And she's just relentlessly positive. Like you need a oh, mother. Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. She's just, we're going to get this done and it's going to be okay. And, and the boys need to hear that. And they don't have anybody else in their life to give that to them. So even though Jody and Donna aren't the right age, um, they, they definitely still do a lot of mothering there. Um, so here's the Mary question. When Mary shows up, um, how does she do as a mother figure? <laughs> Anne? Well, you know, I, I, I spent a long time thinking about Mary because... You know, she is Mother Mary, but it's, it, it to me, her coming back like she did, um, I think it just really threw her for a loop. And, and, you know, the writers tended to write her like that. And I think that that goes along with, you know, she's so shocked to find that her sons that she did not want to be in the life are hunters. And she doesn't, you know, it's such a shock. She doesn't understand how that happened. And even though they explain it to her and then she reads John's journal, I think that reading through that and reading through what he went through after she died the first time, um, it, 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 she just really didn't know how to handle it and you know she had a baby and a four-year-old and all at once she's faced with these two grown men that she you doesn't have all these know expectations of her as mother yeah and and they wanted this idyllic ideal vision as you said of a mother and she she did she didn't know how to do that 
that was never who she was. That was no. all. <laughs> and a, even though she she wanted out of the out of the game, I think that then she felt she, you know, she went back because she was so unsure about what was going on and what was going on in her own mind and trying to adjust to all this that she fell back into what she knew best, which was hunting. Okay. Electra? Um, she did get to burst all of Dean's bubbles, everything he remembered about mom who made, made pies and meatloaf and all that home cooking. It turned out that his real mom was the Piggly Wiggly, <laughs> um, which which was, was quite a shock to him. <laughs> But I mean, they did retcon her a little bit, yeah. Because when we when we see her in in when when she first meets John, um, you know, she doesn't want to be a hunter anymore, and she's trying to get out, and that's why she's, you know, getting involved with somebody who's not in the life. And you know, when they bring her back, they bring her back as someone who can't wait to get involved. Well, because yeah. I, I think she's so traumatized. I mean, like, you know, one day, you know, her husband and she has small children. And then next thing you know, her husband's gone and her children are these grown men. I mean, that, that you know, I'd run away too for a while. <laughs> well, I mean, she could have been like trying to make a home out of the bunker too. But, but instead, you know, she ran off and, and started hunting again, which was an interesting reaction. Okay. Hansi? Interesting choice. It, it sounds like PTSD to me, you know, like fight or, fight or flight, you know, like it was just too much for her and she knew how to fight, you know. Also then with, you got to talk like with the Winchesters and stuff because then, right, like she was, you know, you know all about her hunting background and stuff. And yeah, they wanted to have a normal life, but she made that deal. So I don't know. I feel bad for her. I think she got a really raw deal. Um, okay. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Yeah. Anna? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the whole thing about Mary and was completely retconned because in season one, she it's not at all clear that she has any idea that there's anything related to the supernatural. You will look at her behavior in the pilot. This is not the behavior of a hunter. You know, like there's there's a fog of breath in front of her mouth and the light is going out and she just taps at it and looks confused. And then she goes into her son's nursery and she's shocked by things. So, right. Like, but if she had started that, whipping out salt and stuff, it might have like. I, well, sure. But by the, and by the time they brought her back in season 12, 11, whatever it was, like they had already done a lot of retconning because they'd already made her come from a family of hunters, which that was not at all clear that she had come from a family of hunters from the beginning. There was no suggestion of that whatsoever. And so, yeah, you know, well, wait, like, no, when you do this. Because there's, there's the whole angel thing early on with that, you know, have to get John and Mary together, This right? Yeah, I know. I know. And that was not my favorite storyline of this <laughs> series to begin with so I just like within the confines of what they constructed over the over the series when they got to the point where they brought Mary back then yeah like I guess they had to have her manifest as having some sort of PTSD because she was ripped from heaven and you know thrust back into a life that she thought that she'd escaped but I don't know. I just what would you have a liked, lot. What would you have preferred for her? I think I would have preferred for her to not come back at all. If I'm honest, because <laughs> I don't know how you, I don't know how you carry forward this complete like retrofit of the whole show in a manner yes, that, I, that gives I, you a character that you that Plan. you care yeah. about or who you know behaves behaves in a manner that is totally understandable so yeah okay Lorena as far as a mother figure um I think a couple of points she never got a chance to learn how to be a mother so when your children are born they're totally dependent on you and they teach you how to be a mother 
they tell you what they need. What and you know, at first it's just to be fed and when to go to bed and when to be cleaned. And so you, they're teaching you what to do. But as they go through school, you learn how to help them with uh, maturity, how to how to help them intellectually with schoolwork, how to help them socially with friends. So you learn all that as you, as they as they grow up. You grow up as a mother. And she never got that experience. She got to preschool. And that was as simple as her lessons were for motherhood. So as everyone's pointed out, then all of a sudden she has grown children and they don't need mothering. They need, they, um, <laughs> they were hoping for a, a mother that they, that Dean remembered but they didn't um they didn't really need a mother and she yeah. she sensed that i think and i think she did sense that i do because i think she did for them the one thing that she could cling to that she knew how to do which was i never wanted you to be in this life so the best thing i can do for you is to get rid of all of the monsters so that your life is freed up to be what it want, what whatever you want it to be. So she went off with these, you know, crazy men of letters to try and rid the world of monsters for her sons. So I yeah. think she tried to do what she could to um, whether it was it couldn't be guilt. I mean, maybe it was guilt, but to alleviate guilt or to alleviate their burden or to just do for them whatever, the only thing she knew how to do for them. Because she yeah. certainly didn't learn how to be a mother to them. Even when- I think you know, you're totally children... right. I, I think you're totally right. But I also think that neither Sam nor Dean actually expected her to do anything more than just be there. Because they had grown up without like that sort of apple pie mom, they weren't expecting her to change their diapers and kiss their boo-boos. They were just expecting her to be there and she wouldn't, <laughs> right? Like they are, they, they're more, more than, but more than just, she no, and I understand and I that they're grown they're, men and they don't but, need her to yeah. like mommy them. They just want her to be there so that they can get to know her again, so that they can spend time with her. And she was like, well, you're expecting far too much from me. Therefore I must go off and kill all the monsters. And I think both of them are like, um, what if you just had dinner with us? Could we start there? Yeah, I, I agree I with you not- from that standpoint, but I think also um, from a complex woman's standpoint, you know, we just want you to stay home and be a friend to us. We just want to get to know you. Um, and she was a, a grown complex woman and she wanted somehow to contribute. And her idea of, of contributing wasn't, I will learn how to make meatloaf. I will uh, learn how to tidy up around here. I will be here when you get back from your hunts that can last a week or two weeks or three weeks. And I'll be here and expecting her to just wait around to, um, you know, kind of fulfill their need to get to know a mother wasn't respecting that she was also a woman and a complex woman and a strong woman. And she had to kind of carve out her own life. So she carved out a life that respected what she knew how to do and what she was capable of doing, but also would benefit her children. I disagree. I, I think they did expect her to be a mom and that doesn't necessarily mean making pies, but there is a certain level of, of stress that women absorb uh, from men. <laughs> In fact, 80% of autoimmune diseases are, are women because we're always sort of momming their emotions. You know, it's just kind of a dynamic unless, you know, the two of you can work out, but that's generally the dynamic between men and women. And I think even without like them expecting the perfect housekeeper with an apron and all that, they still ex- expected her to sit down, listen to their problems, absorb their issues, you know, be there for them in that way that women are, that they're not always for themselves. Well, and I think the other possibility is something that many of us have to confront 
when we take an adult look back at our own memories is that some people just aren't good parents. <laughs> they might be giving it all they've got, but maybe Mary never really was going to be a good mother in terms of nurturing. Uh, we don't know how good uh, Deanna was in terms of that. We've seen a dark side to Samuel. Um, it's hard to give what you don't, what you didn't get unless you really go out looking for it. And the Winchesters aren't big on therapy. Um, <laughs> so, Why is Dean so good with children? Because he had to raise one. Um, but it may have just been that Mary wasn't going to be a, a great parent in terms of anything more than keeping them alive. We certainly. Dean, but Dean, but Dean was happy just playing words with friends with his mom. He was like, this is, this is, this is enough, right? Like, I get that this is weird for you. It's weird for me. It's weird for Sam. It's weird for everybody. But maybe we just play words with friends and talk occasionally, right? And mostly Dean doesn't really want to talk about emo emotions anyway. So like, he's not expecting her to like mom him. He just wants her to be. But be there, like. Be, be around, him. right? Like, just right. be around, right? Like, and he's not, like, he doesn't need her to cook. What, like, he's he's disappointed that it turns out the meatloaf is from Piggly Wiggly and all the pies are and whatever, right? But, like, Dean, Dean, Dean's like, okay. I, I, I'll, I do I'll do the cooking. You and I have cooking. different, you know, views of this. I agree to disagree. <laughs> I was disappointed that the writers chose to bring her back and immediately write her out. You know, if you were going to bring her back, then make Mary Winchester, make Sam Smith a part of each episode. Don't bring her back and then say, oops, we really can't have her in every episode. So we're going to have her go away. That was just inconsistent, a kind of whiplash, I think, for the audience. If either she's in alive and part of the story or just leave the memory, but they brought her back and then cut her out. And I, as far as a writing standpoint, I was disappointed in that choice. And they did a lot of it because of the, you know, casting and having her up there in Vancouver and all the practical reasons of why they said she went off and couldn't be in every episode. But from a story standpoint, it was a disservice, I think, both to the character and the story and Sam Smith. Yeah, I think I the other with piece with that is that Let's think of it from an outsider perspective. The show is about two hot guys who live in a secret bunker and drive around in a muscle car hunting ghosts and killing demons. And if Mary is there all of the time, the show is about two unmarried bachelors pushing 40 <laughs> who live in a basement with their mother. <laughs> yeah. Changes it's already a sausage mess. <laughs> She changes everything. Okay, two points for Gail for that one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you, you, you've got a fair point there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what about Rowena as a mother? Any thoughts? Oh, yeah. No, totally. Well, she is, right? She's the mother yeah. of Crowley, the king of hell. Yeah. And she's a terrible mother, right? Like, she sold Crowley to a pig farmer for something. I don't remember what, but... Three yeah. coins. He says he was worth at least five. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, it was quite a lot at the time. It's quite a lot at the time. Well, and and she's Marlena unapologetic talks, about no, that. She talks she's about just like about being a businesswoman and a modern woman who, you know, you couldn't just expect me to stay home with you, Fergus. Right? <laughs> How dare you, well, Fergus? He have done all right for himself. Well, he... Well, he too yeah. sold a soul for an extra three inches below the belt. So query whether he <laughs> made all the right decisions. But, but he did become king of that. He did become king of that. I mean, she treated him badly, but ultimately she did actually care about him as her son. I mean, did she, him. or did she mostly care about, what was his name? Otto? Oscar? Oscar. Oscar. <laughs> no, but that probably, she was upset about Crowley for a while. You know, it was her son. And then... And you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> she cared enough about Sam and Dean to come and help them with magic stuff, and and bequeathed all her her worldly laboratory stuff to Sam. 
Yes. And yes. I, I think she saw Sam at, I mean, of course. Well, it, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Like her mothering of Crowley was terrible, but then she kind of like, for the boys, she was kind of like, they're weird auntie. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Weird auntie. Yes. She was very transactional. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She also I totally would have mother from, Charlie. The, mm -hmm. the lesson she that. learned uh, along the way, as you know, as we saw, as things happened to her, she started learning more and changing quite a bit. And a lot of it was the influence of Sam and Dean. And the, so I think she was changing. And the only kindness she was showing to Crowley was later in life because of how she had changed and when he came back into her life. Mm -hmm. But as far as a mother, yes, she had little sparks of caring for him, especially, you know, at the end. But mm, for a very long time, he was just a means to an end of, you know, her power, her position, um, that he, she wanted him to be a king of uh, import in hell so that she could have a position of power in hell and so I don't think it was till way at the end that she got a little bit of redemption as a mother. Mm -hmm. How did the boys end up mothering each other? I mean, here you've got two guys who grow grow up in the backseat of a car and a series of crummy hotel rooms. Um, and yet we see glimpses of them hatching each other up, eating breakfast. You know, how how did they mother each other? Because I'll contend that Dean not only mothered Sam, but Sam in many ways, whether Dean liked it or not, tried to mother him right back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think that that you see it in in all the the instances of patching each other up and and Sam trying to make Dean understand certain things um, about their. You know, I mean, I I see that I one scene that stands out is when they were trying not to eat the stuff that had been contaminated by the leviathans Productive. and they're in the store and they come out and and Dean says I can't eat rabbit food I'm a warrior but but Sam has bought all this fresh food that is not contaminated and and you know just says you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> and and so we see we see De Dean do more of the mothering in those flashbacks of when, you know, Sam was small and, and he was trying to take care of him. But, but when they get, I think it, I think the tables turn when, when they both get older and after Sam comes back, you know, he sees Dean having you know being more reckless and he tries to pull Dean back from being so reckless about certain things you know just charging in um instead of just charging in Sam does the research and figures out you know how to kill a particular monster before Dean just goes and brandishes whatever weapon comes to hand and so I, I think that there's that give and take more when they're older um, you know, simply because they are older and and Sam has come into his own as a as a person. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Christmas presents. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> um, the scene that comes to mind for me is when they're in the bunker later and Dean makes burgers because now he has a kitchen. Yeah. And yeah. Sam's like, you cooked these? And he's like, yeah, I have a kitchen now. Yeah, and it's, it's nesting. It's like, you know, like we're grownups and we can we can make stuff for each other. It's the first time he's ever had his own room. Yeah, well, that was, that was, he was nesting. But, <laughs> but you know, he, he made Sam lunch while Sam was, was doing something on the computer. And, and that was just such a great example of them taking care of each other. Ponzi? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. They definitely parented each other. That's, you know, and, and they did a hell of a job considering, you know, uh, the, the stuff they went through. But um, yeah, it's like the, the, like I said, like the Christmases, you know, and that 
Dean always made sure that Sam had a Christmas, even if it ended up being a Barbie doll, <laughs> you know, or something weird. And then when Dean's going to go and he, you know, he wants like one last Christmas and Sam is so opposed to it, but then ultimately he realizes, you know, this is so important to them. And there's such a that touching moment when they're like opening their ridiculous gas station presents in the hotel room. And <laughs> Yep. Anna? Yeah. And Sam, I agree with you, Gail, that Sam, as he gets older, tr not only tries to mother Dean to a certain extent, but also takes on the responsibility of kind of like pushing Dean emotionally to talk about his feelings more, to be more empathetic with victims, to, you know, like just acknowledge that he has feelings, that that things affect him and that he needs to, that he needs to process his trauma. And so, you know, Dean has spent his whole life caring for the physical needs of his little brother and sort of being like the mom who cooks the food and, you know, patches up the, the cuts on the knees and, you know, is sort of like in charge of things. But Sam, I think, fairly, you know, like probably by the time he's a teenager is the one who's like, okay, so also we need to deal with our inside life. We need to deal with our emotions. We need to deal with what, what's going on. We need to process the trauma that we've been going through and we need to not just push everything down because that's just a recipe for disaster. No chick flick moments. Yeah. You love chick flicks. Sam knows he loves chick flicks and Dean knows he loves chick flicks. He and he does flicks. get he does get Dean to see that it's not a black or white situation. Every monster doesn't have to be killed, you know. Yes. Just huge progress. Lorena? Yes. I think in their unconditional devotion to each other and in how deeply they know each other. So they, in any situation, they know how the other is going to react, not only as a soldier, but as an individual. Um, how emotionally they're going to react, how psychologically they're going to react. They know how to um, anticipate the other one, the other person's needs and try to fill those needs. And their devotion is that of a mother figure of, you know, you're lost. I'm going to move heaven and earth to find you. I'm going to, I had a mother friend of mine say once, you know, I would reach into hell to save my children. And that's exactly what they literally did for each other. So it, there was this, um, it, I know a lot of people have called it that it was dysfunctional, but if you're looking at them as mothers to each other, if that was a mother doing it for a child, you wouldn't think it was as dis, as dysfunctional. So the, yeah. it, the, it, rather than it being their sibling relationship that was taking place at that time, it could be their mothering relationship of, um, I'm going to be here for you no matter what, no matter what you do wrong, no matter how much trouble you get in, no matter what others think of you, I am here for you. And that was a yes. mothering role, I think, for each other. For sure. Yeah, I mean, Dean may have ironed Sam's shirts with beer. Um, but he did iron them. Not, he did iron them. I'm not judging. Um, but I, I agree with what Lorena said because so much of their relationship, you know, Sam trying to tell Dean, I would die for you too. Of course I would do anything for you. You would do that for me. Why don't you believe that I would do that for you? And so there is reciprocity there takes them a while to figure that out and put it into words and accept it. Um, but that's very much of a caretaking thing about, you know, well, you're taking care of me. I'm going to take care of you right back. And I think Sam had to mature into that a little bit. Maybe that came more after he got back from Stanford and, and sort of could see things with different eyes. But I think that that absolutely was a core piece of keeping themselves both alive and then to look forward to retiring and heaven. And, you know, so much so much curtain fic in the fanfic world of Sam and Dean in heaven is all about them finally getting a house or a cabin or some sort of dwelling where they can go back to the kind of hom hominess that they had at the bunker, but not have to go out on hunts anymore. 
and you know kind of how they they mature into that well folks we have come to the end of our time and tech problems aside this has been a wonderful conversation but let's go around real quickly and uh, let everybody know where we can find you online and um i'm mostly on facebook um ann wicker and uh, but i'm also on instagram uh just search my name and look for the bracelets and and it's me um, I'm also in Gail's group, the uh, Team Free Will NC uh, Facebook group, uh, pretty active in there. And just any, and and also I'll be at cons. Well, I'm going to be one here in Charlotte, but anyway. Okay, Electra? Um, you can find anything about me at untilmidnight.com. And I'm on Mastodon as Electra at wandering dot shop very good hansi uh hansi oppenheimer and my company squee projects and it's squee projects or my name everywhere on twitter instagram tiktok facebook etc anna by me mostly at annakensing.com most of the social media sites under my name although my active participation waxes and wanes depending on how much i'm procrastinating writing um, I'm often on supernatural panels and I just wanted to put in a plug just briefly before we end for Eve, because, you know, like literal mother of all as a mother figure. Anyway, moving Good on. Good one. Good one. Uh, Lorena? On Facebook for my Twilight book, I'm at Fan Phenomena Twilight. In Instagram, Lorena Aker. In Twitter, LS Angel and the number two. And on my Instagram profile, you can find all of the links for the Winchester family business, which is Win Fam business uh, for all of the above named social media sites. And I'm pretty easy to find online, gailcmartin.com, morganbrice.com, spell it right, and you'll find me on pretty much all of the major social media uh, platforms. I am a columnist for the Winchester family business and reviewing Walker. I run the Supernatural TFWNC group uh, on Facebook. Mostly, you can find me here on Continual. So thank you all for braving the technology issues and for a wonderful conversation. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There will be more Supernatural coming up soon. So we'll see you online.